All right, guys, thanks so much for coming out. Um, Tom and I want to extend thanks to the BHIS folks for putting on this awesome conference. I think it's going to be one of these annual things that we're going to attend more. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for coming out, guys. Um, so t we're talking about uh, geolocation-based password or wordless generation with Wordsmith. So uh, to get some formalities out of the way, my name is Sanjiv Kawa. Um, you can find me on Twitter at HackerJiv. Um, my roots are in IT and dev. I've had a really fortunate career so far. I've um, been on the help desk receiving angry calls from users. Um, I've been a system administrator, a security consultant, and I worked for a little, a little time at an enterprise Linux company writing Java. So I'm really sorry if you're running any of my code. It's really bad. Um, I'm currently a senior pen tester at PSC. Um, a lot of my day-to-day -day activity uh, involves traversing large enterprise networks and trying to overcome segmentation boundaries uh, in interesting ways to get to uh, the cardholder data environment, which is just a secure network zone where credit cards live. Um, if you're interested in pen testing, come and find me after. We're always looking for good talent. If you're interested in uh, kind of circumventing or subverting or overcoming segmentation boundaries, um, check out a talk that Patrick Fussell did uh, at B-Size DC. Uh, it's really good. Um, yeah, something I'm trying to get better at is binary analysis, exploit dev. So if you want to talk about disassembling binaries, finding tricky places in memory to inject shell code and jumping around like a madman, uh, come find me and talk about that stuff as well. I'm Tom Porter. You can find me at Porter House on Twitter and GitHub. Uh, my FSI career started on the blue side, doing flow data analytics and network situational awareness. I then transitioned over to the red side, doing penetration testing, primarily in the PCI realm and then more recently red teaming. And I've worked on some extensions for the Bloodhound project. I recently joined the red team over at Fusion X as a security consultant. But my true passion in a previous life, I was a professional baseball player. And this being October, it's my favorite time of the MLB season because I get to watch another DC sports team lose in the first round. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, who here has used Wordsmith? Seriously? I thought Tom and I were the only people who used it. That's amazing. Awesome. <laughs> so um, really at its core, all Wordsmith is is a wordless generation tool. Um, but the only thing that's different, that Tom and I are just using it for geolocation data. Um, so basically, we just kind of started on a project and started working together because uh, we wanted to write some code and we wanted to work on something cool. And um, we kept on seeing passwords in the wild, uh, which, are, which contained things very local to, to a user's um, sort of area. So things like sport team names, things like um, cities, landmarks, and in some cases, even the street that they grew up on. So taking all this data, we wrapped it into a tool called Wordsmith, so you can generate, user, uh, you can generate geolocation based word lists on the fly. Um, now, pushing it forward just a little bit, we also wanted to move past just wordless generation for password cracking and brute force password attacks. And we wanted to do geolocation-based username generation. So a scenario for this might be, let's say you're doing an internal pen test in South Dakota. And you've scraped LinkedIn and you've grabbed a whole bunch of usernames. But it might not be enough to do a really constructive password spraying attack. So now you can get usernames based on US Census data and other things for that particular geolocation and construct usernames um, for that location. Um, yeah. So we presented version one. I'm wearing the exact same shirt. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, that was not planned. Uh, we presented version one at B-Slides Las Vegas last year. And it was the first con that we ever spoke at. And it was a lot of fun. And it was really cool. Um, and yeah, so version one of Wordsmith was like really focused on US data. Um, and it worked from a state down approach. So like, for, exa for example, um, for the state of Nevada, we would grab all this, I'm using the laser here because it's kind of cool. We're grabbing all this data, uh, like uh, street roads and landmarks. And sp I think Nevada doesn't have a sports team yet, do they? They might. They're getting one. They're getting one, aren't they? they do. Oh, yeah, yeah. And football, too. Yeah, so. All this sort of geolocation related data was collected for these various states in the US. Um, and some additional uh, features that we built into Wordsmith version 1 was integrating uh, or at least supporting Cool. And if you're unfamiliar with Cool, it's a really uh, cool uh, tool that Digi Ninja, Robin Wood, wrote. Um, essentially, let's say you're testing grocerystore.com or electronicstore.com that week and you want to get some really targeted 
um, words to use in your word list, be it for password cracking or brute force password attacks. Well, cool, we'll go out to that website and scrape every single string in between those HTML tags, and um, that will contain like client names and interesting things from the About Me page and services and all these different words, right? So once you marry that with geolocation data, you get some really cool targeted passwords that you can use. Um, some other additional features, we just did some basic mangling, and you can specify minimum character length. So let's say uh, you know that a particular domain has a password policy of seven character uh, par uh, minimum character lengths for passwords. You can just strip anything lower than that, and so you're not you know, wasting guess encrypt, uh, guess encrypt compare cycles when you're cracking later on. Um, so after releasing WordSmith version one, we got a ton of f uh, feedback from the community. And um, it was awesome, because it made us realize that we could create a better tool, and the demand was kind of there to create a better tool. So um, the top three things were, one, more countries obviously need to be available. And so we were only doing stuff for the US before. Um, and I've got friends in Canada, somewhere in this room. I've got friends in Europe who are like, WordSmith is really cool, but you know, there's no data for these other countries. Um, in addition to that, there needs to be a way to introduce your own data. Um, WordSmith version one was very static. So if you wanted to, I don't know, introduce a structured list that you wanted to introduce as part of a word list, then um, doing that in WordSmith version one would probably just break it because it wasn't very uh, modular and extensible. And that's something else that we wanted to introduce in a uh, later version. And uh, one of the other requests was WordSmith was very limited to the English language. Now, interacting with it on a command line is still going to be in English, but all those data sets underneath, um, we've got a whole bunch of different languages now, so that's kind of cool as well. So uh, taking all these recommendations, born was version two. So now we've got geolocation data for almost every single country and territory in the entire world, um, over 230 to be exact. Um, we also have multiple language files, um, and these are all UTF-8s, and we've got files for uh, Spanish and French and German and a um, whole bunch of different languages. Um, because version two was such a ground up rewrite, I don't think we used any of the code from version one. Um, a new CLI was born of that too, and Tom spent a lot of time kind of enhancing that user experience and making it a really beautiful thing to interact with in the most logical sense and functional sense too. Um, yeah, looking, again, analyzing more passwords, um, we saw that people would introduce things like god names or book names or verses into their passwords, and there's just not a good way to pick those out. So we started introducing religious texts. So we got a couple of different Bibles in there and got the Quran and uh, plan on introducing more religions as well. Spoke about usernames already. What's that? <laughs> Um, and yeah, we kind of, uh, an, an, another big thing that we wanted was to make it more modular and extensible so you can introduce your own files with ease uh, in the hopes that more community contribu contribution exists there and um, stuff like that. So yeah, speaking about some of the data sources, um, the CIA World Factbook is amazing and it acts like a, as a good anchor point for finding all this data, but basically the CIA has gone out there and collected a whole bunch of metadata for every single country in the world. And uh, you can pull things down like population counts and the official and common languages in that country and religions and political parties and all these cool things which have words that could be part of someone's password. Um, when we were looking at introducing different languages, what we were thinking about doing was raiding the NICS repositories and just like grabbing all the different language files. But looking at those, they're actually quite small because they only have to contain words for the operating system. And typically those are more technical words as well. So an idea, you know, a light bulb goes off in your head and you're like, well, spell check uh, files contain basically an entire language dictionary. So why don't we go look at Huntspell? Why don't we go look at OpenOffice and LibreOffice? And there's been tons of community contribution from native speakers uh, just uploading uh, language files and um, like dict and affixation formats. And once you blend those together and um, it's really dry, but you can create full languages for a whole bunch of different languages. Um, who here has parsed Wikipedia before? It is, yeah, shelf. <laughs> There's a reason that only one person has done it, because you're not insane. Uh, it's, uh, it is tedious, grueling, uh, unhappy work. But we've, we've built some parsers, so you guys can use those after. Um, but yeah, so some of, the, some of the things that we're grabbing from Wikipedia are like sport teams and colleges, universities, as well as landmarks and archaeological sites for the world. Um, so, you know, it's kind of cool. Um, Project Gutenberg, I think, is one of the more awesome data sources on here. Um, if you're unfamiliar with them, they basically take cultural works, which are uh, traditionally on text, and digitalize those 
so that you can basically use them if you want to. So things like older versions of the Bibles, um, Qurans, and different religious texts. So that's where we're pulling that sort of stuff from. And they have like really workable license frameworks like GPL, MIT, or even free licenses. So you can basically manipulate that data as you want. Um, I'm going to pass this clicker off to Tom here so he can speak more about these other data sources. And yeah. Thanks, Inch. Mm -hmm. So for those of you unfamiliar with OpenStreetMap, it's this community of mappers that came together to basically build their own open source version of something like Google Maps. Now we can take that data, pull it down, parse it locally for interesting things like cities and counties and roads. This is kind of our first foray outside the U.S. to the rest of the world since uh, Wordsmith's initial purview is just the U.S. The U.S. Census Bureau it was our canonical source of zip codes and area codes. We can use these as attributes and to uh, prepend and append these to words that we generate. The Social Security Administration maintains this list of the most popular names in each state dating back to something like 1910. So we can take that data and aggregate it and use that for um, some attributes and for username generation. So this is how you get Wordsmith to the command line, and we'll make these slides available too. Um, but you can do a git clone of the repository URL. You can optionally uh, do that bundle install. We include a gem file to facilitate that. Uh, that is if you want to use those cool integration options. But it's completely optional. Wordsmith will work out of the box without that. So this is some of the output that you see. It's going to, upon first run, unpack this data archive, data.tar.exe. And what happens is it inflates that into a data directory, which is like a flat file database almost that we use to query uh, with Wordsmith. I recommend you check out the README, because it's going to have a lot of the structure of the tool and how it works. Um, or use the dash E, the example flag, when you run Wordsmith. The main script is wordsmith.rb. Now, to use Wordsmith, there's kind of two components you need to be cognizant of. One is our boundaries, or inputs. That's the dash capital I flag. That's all the areas of the world that you want to get data for. So this could be something like top level country. It could be a state or a province. It could be a county or a city. It depends how granular you want to get. The other thing that you have to do is specify what kinds of words, what types of words you want to generate for that area. We call them attributes. So here in our example, we're generating words for the USA dash ROB roads, dash LB landmarks. You see some of the other examples of things that we support there. So to use those boundaries, it helps to know a little bit about the data structure of how we organize all these directories and subdirectories. So if you look inside that data directory, you'll see all of these subdirectories of, um, that contain three letters. And these correspond to the ISA Alpha 3 country codes. So the US, the USA, Great Britain's GBR, Germany's DEU, South Africa, ZAF, and so on. If you dive into one of those countries, like USA, you'll see here we have more subdirectories. These are in a two-letter state abbreviation format. And you'll see this for other places like Canada, for its provinces. You also start to see some text files. If you see a file that ends in .txt, that is one of our attributes. So that CIA.txt is the CIA World Factbook data for the US that we parsed out. So if you call that attribute from the command line, it's going to go grab this file and return it back to you. We also have these YAML files. They're basically like configuration files for each country and territory. And it has some metadata about that country. We can use that in our queries. If you go down a level deeper, like here I'm now in the North Carolina directory, you see a bunch more attribute files. We got things like cities and colleges and roads and landmarks. Um, and this is where most of our data lives on the USA front. You can even get more granular. Like if you can go ahead and create a subdirectory called Charlotte and then put a file in there for sports.txt, this will have the Charlotte Hornets and the Carolina Panthers. Keep pounding. Keep pounding. <laughs> the way that translates over to the command line is for each subdirectory, you basically just substitute in a hyphen or a dash. So North Carolina be USA dash NC, Charlotte be USA dash NC dash Charlotte. If you want to specify multiple boundaries, basically just use this comma separated list. So if you want data for USA and Canada, it's USA comma CAN. If you want data for South Dakota, North Dakota, and Colorado, it's USA-SD, USA-ND, USA-CO. 
One of the things that we could do with the World Factbook data was we, we had all these uh, population statistics, statistics for each country. So we parsed those out, sorted them from most populous to least populous, and now you can have a, a numeric input to the input flag. And this will grab the n most populous countries as your input. So this will be, in this case, the 10 most populous countries. Another option is to use something that we call regions. And this is basically like an alias for several boundaries. So if you want to get all the data for, say, Europe, and you don't want to type in every single European country on the command line, you can go out to this regions.csv file and see what, um, what we've created. So the way that it's here, I've grepped out Europe. The first value is the name of your region or alias. The second value is a description of that region. And then the third value are all the boundary members of it. So you see like Poland and uh, Italy and a bunch of other ones on there. Now you can just go back over to the Wordsmith command line, specify the region Europe as your input, and it's going to pull in all those different countries. We can include a lot of these um, prepackaged in Wordsmith. And so here are some examples of ones that we included for the US. We also have things like world organizations like NAFTA and EU. We have continents, so if you want South America or uh, Africa, you can pull that in. We have a catch-all alias. That we, our region that we just call all. So if you use all, it's going to traverse every single boundary that we have. So that's how we specify where we want the words from. These are the types of words that we're generating. We call them attributes. And you can see a list here. There's quite a few that we have dedicated options for. The two I want to call your attention to is dash uh, lowercase a. This is our all flag. That's going to pull down every single attribute that you see there. We also have the dash b flag. It's kind of our miscellaneous option. So if you add your own data into the flat file database and there is not a dedicated option to support that, you can use dash b and it's going to pull in the customized data that you input. So some simple examples of how these work together. So at the top I'm entering all the zip codes for South Dakota. In the middle I'm getting the rows, counties, and landmarks for England, which the input's going to be gbr dash eng. At the bottom I'm getting all attributes for the continent of Asia. So it's pulling in that region, Asia, getting all the countries from it, and then it's getting every single attribute from all of those countries and returning everything. If you're curious what boundaries are available to you and what attributes are available to you, we built this thing that we call child nodes. So you give it a boundary, you give it a dash capital C, and it's gonna basically build this tree starting at a parent node and showing you all the child nodes. And for each boundary, it's gonna show you the dedicated or are the uh, attributes for it. So here we specify Great Britain. Great Britain is then broken up into Scotland, Wales, England. England's broken up into uh, historic counties. Some of those historic counties are broken up into administrative counties, like Sussex, breaking up into East and West Sussex. So when you look for an attribute, like if I call cities for Great Britain, it's going to start at the parent and then traverse down all the child nodes, grab those, and return it. And we touched on the CIA World Factbook. If you go out to the YAML configuration file for a given country or territory, you're going to see this kind of data. So we're pulling out uh, population data, which we already talked about how we use that with inputs. And then most common languages spoken, and most um, common language, uh, religions practiced. So for religions, in the dash G flag, like these are the re religious texts that we pulled out of Project Gutenberg. We've got things like the King James Bible, uh, the NIV version, the Quran, uh, some others in different languages. And if we look at a specific country and we see that its primary religion is Catholicism, we can pull in the appropriate religious text. There's a few different ways that we parse those texts. So in the middle you see one way where we're grabbing the Bible book, chapter, and verse, and we mangle it a little bit. And the reason we do that, I don't know if any of you guys have a hash cracked in the South. There's a lot of John 3.16s and Psalm 23s out there. So that's the reason for that. At the bottom, we have um, another way that we parse where we just pull out every single unique word. On the languages side, dash V option, we looked at, um, across all of our configuration files, what were the most commonly spoken languages? And then we grabbed like 13 most popular, and then Sanj put together these dictionaries for those 13. So if you look at the markers for, say, the US, where the most popular languages are English and Spanish, we'll go out and grab those two dictionaries and pull them in. Now we touched on with Wordsmith V2, this is a roundup rewrite and it had a modular design when we did that. So this is what kind of looks like an action. 
imagine that uh, you want to create a new attribute for all the lakes in Minnesota. So you go out to the Minnesota directory, and you create a new file, lakes.txt. You go out to your um, source of all your lakes, you parse it, and then you put the, in this file a list that's newline delimited and already sorted, preferably, to level of processing. You can see it here. You can then go back to the wordsmith command line and use that dash b option. And that's going to pull in all those miscellaneous files. Lakes does not have a dedicated option in our help menu. But it's going to grab this file from Minnesota. Now we architected it like this because we wanted an easy way for folks to contribute back. Like you don't need to know how to write code or like work in IDE or anything like that. All you need is the ability to uh, open up a text file, put some data in it, and then upload it to GitHub or send us a pull request. So you've got your boundaries, you've got your attributes, so you're generating words. These are the different options you can use for, for changing that output. So at the top there, by default, uh, Wordsmith is going to dump all the words it generates to the console. It can get uh, pretty loud. So if you want to write that to a file, you can combine these options, dash Q and dash show. It's going to quiet the output and then write all the results to a file that you specify. In the middle there are some ways that um, you can change these words as they're being generated. So you can specify minimal lengths, max lengths. You can do some basic word mingling. So you can like split on spaces, split on words, or split on uh, special characters. Um, we have a, an alias or an option dash m here, which is our general mangling option. It's going to do all those things for you. So if you want to generate as many words as possible, you would use the mangling. At the bottom, we have um, some pre-pending and appending options. Like with zip codes and area codes, or you can splice in your own custom word list. So quick examples of how you might tweak that output. Here I'm generating roads for DC, for Washington DC. And one of those that might come back would be Pennsylvania F. If you combine that with the dash M option for mangling, it's going to do that basic mangling where it's going to take Pennsylvania space av period. It's going to remove the special characters, remove the spaces, split on the spaces, and it's turned one word into seven. You can specify a minimum character length, of, character length of eight, and it's going to remove those words that don't meet that criteria. Similarly, with the dash D option, this is our Windows default complexity. So let's say that you are maybe do an online attack about, against something that might be AD back, and you think they're using a default Windows pass, uh, password policy, this is going to filter out any words that are at least eight characters in length and don't match three or four cases of upper, lower, and American special. This is an example in the syntax that it looks like of uh, doing the, getting the, generating all attributes with quiet output and writing it out to a file. So this is for South Dakota. This is what the quiet output looks like. It shows you how many words we're generating for each attribute. Then at the end, it does this big sort of unique, and then writes it to a file. Here we wrote out a little over 1.2 million words for South Dakota. I don't know if you guys saw this article uh, a little over a year ago now on Ars Technica. It was about this drug dealer and who allegedly sold drugs online and sold food. And he eventually got busted. Um, his, his machines were confiscated. And his PGP key, they found his password was asshole209. Anybody know where that 209 might have come from? Area code? It was his area code of where he lived. So Sandra and I saw this and we're like, we have to include this in words with this too cool. So we have these options for you prepending and appending area codes and zip codes, or your own supplied or user supplied word list. So let's say you create a file that has a lot of common suffixes for passwords. So you have things like 17 and 2017, 2017 bank, and then you generate colleges, which is the dash F flag for South Dakota, and you append with dash capital Y this file, and you see now we got August Santa's 2017, Black Hill 17 bang. These are the pass, these look like, what could be passwords for people from those areas? Names is an interesting one. Um, there's a few things we're doing with it. One are just general attributes. So you can just get the first names for an area, or get the last names, or get both with the dash in option. We also use these for username generation. So this is what those options look like. The first few there are just general formatting. So like first name, last name, first initial last name, uh, first name, dot last name, and so on. The bottom three options give the ability to, uh, you can like truncate usernames, you can change how many usernames that you're generating. 
excuse me, so as a quick example, here I'm generating usernames for USA in a first name, last name format. I've got James Smith, James Johnson, James Williams, and so on. The bottom is the same thing, but now our format is first name, dot, last name. And here we're grabbing the top 100 first names and the top 100 last names and splicing them together. Now we have uh, literally hundreds of thousands of names, and it's just not feasible to splice all of those together. So we have kind of the same default there. Let's say you're going up against an application that's maybe backed by a mainframe where they truncate usernames at eight characters. You specify the dash dash truncate flag, it's going to do that for you. And like I mentioned, we're only using the 100 most popular first names and last names for a given boundary. And that's going to generate about 10,000 usernames. If you want to up that, you change, the, you change that with the name depth flag. So if I kick it up to 250, it's going to generate a little over 62,000 usernames. If I kick that up to 1,000, it's going to generate about a million usernames. And with that, I'll hand it back to Sam for the demo. Yeah, we got a couple of demos here. Um, yeah, so, so this first one, I'll just talk about the scenario. I was on a pen test in Ireland, and I dumped the ntds.dit, got the ntlm hashes, and uh, just going to be creating a um, Irish wordsmith generated word list and just cracking hashes and just looking at some interesting passwords. Um, it's all pre recorded because I don't think it would have been too good to do it live, but yeah. Uh, After Dave's talk. Yeah. Um, you guys, has anyone here heard of ASCII NEMA or ASCINEMA? It's really cool. Yeah, so, um, so basically when I'm doing pen testing gigs, I like to record everything on my console for evidence preservation or whatever. And you can use script. It's great. But um, basically, you had some issues with parsing control characters and just other things. So ASCII name, I, I just quickly put together like the web app so you can pull these flat JSON files. But um, ASCII NEMA does console recording. And you can just kind of select this kind of stuff. And um, I don't know, it's kind of cool. So. Anyways, um, in this particular example, I am creating the, uh, an Irish word list. And I'm just going to use all options, because that's kind of what I, what I would do. Um, yeah, so you can see almost instantly I'm using the quiet flags, because I don't want to have that verbose output onto my screen. And got a couple of mangling options in there and just putting it out into a text file. Um, so yeah, so all of this data is like OSM data and other stuff from Wikipedia. You've got some stuff from the CIA Factbook and religions and um, probably some different languages as well. Um, so in Ireland, you'd probably have the English language and perhaps maybe Gaelic or Irish as well. Um, you know, touching on roads real quick. So when I think of roads, I traditionally think of um, you know numeric street values and things like that, which aren't particularly interesting, but. You know, across, across America, you know, how many Martin Luther King Jr. boulevards are there or George Washington Avenues or whatever? Um, these, thing, these things can actually be used as part of people's passwords, influential people, things to that extent. And that kind of translates and carries on throughout the rest of the world. So you get some really cool different road names that can actually be used as passwords. Um, but yeah, as you can see here, uh, you know, 800K words written to a word list took about 12 seconds to run. So um, not too bad. Um, and everyone kind of knows what Hashcat looks like, but uh, I'm just removing the pot file here. It's not something you usually do, but for the sake of the demo and just to make sure we get some accurate results. Um, these are real client hashes. These are NTLM hashes um, from obviously AD and uh, just using attack mode zero. And um, yeah, some of the rules that, so Tom and I have had some really good um, uh, success with the dead hob zero rule set, uh, dead hobo, dead hob zero. It's just um, 50,000 mangling rules. So basically, you take that one password, and now you can manipulate it 50,000 different times, prepend things, append things, camel casing, character substitution, all that kind of stuff. So you've now taken this 800,000 word word list and expanded it by 50,000 times. Um, so this is just on my MacBook, so it's not particularly fast, but it's a small enough hash set that we can kind of do that. But as you can see, um, there's so this particular client probably had around 580 NTM hashes, but some of those are duplicate passwords. So um, Hashcat would just kind of drop those. And we recovered 101 out of the 533 in about um, a minute and 20 seconds. And that's 20% that's, you know, that's of the hashes for this client um, using mostly just geolocation um, data. Now, obviously, because you're bringing in things like uh, dictionary files as well, you'll get some Perhaps you'll get some really cool different language passwords in there too, and obviously some of the more easier English ones to crack too. So, um, yeah, kind of looking at some of these passwords. 
Um, you've got the usual suspects in the top left, just like really common city names. Um, you've got some really cool like landmarks that exist in Ireland. I found that it, last names were kind of cool as well. So Wolseley, Farriers, Donegal. Um, but the most interesting to me is this address, which was actually someone's password and results to something. Um, so it's kind of cool. Um, now, having a single organization in a, and jumping the hashes of that organization isn't always the most common case. Typically, you're going to be dealing with large multinational organizations that have satellite sites and different offices all across the world. So this particular client has offices in Australia, Canada, and the USA, and I obtained um, the NTLM hashes for this client. Um, now, I'm using the dash J flag because that was going to bring everything down to lower case because I'm going to be applying more, well, just better rules later in hash uh, cracking to those. And um, yeah, using the top 10,000 words takes about four seconds to run in conjunction with those dead hob zero 50,000 rules. And you'll get most of the easy to crack passwords. Rock U, which is another awesome word list, um, takes about 30 minutes to run. You get 476 passwords. And then our wordsmith generated word list for um, Australia, Canada, and the USA it took about 13 minutes to run, and you get uh, you know a couple more passwords there. So looking at these, um, so the most interesting one in Australia was Queenslander. It's a very long password. It's just someone who lives in Queensland, and uh, you know it's just um, something they might not usually get. You also got Parramatta and Primavera, which are kind of like cities uh, that might not be, exist in other lists. Um, Canada's not that interest. Well, Canada is interesting, just in a password context. There wasn't much interesting stuff there. It's actually not. It's not interesting? Canada's not interesting. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, so you got, yeah, Canada 1984 uh, and Vancouver. Matthew 2222 might be a reference towards uh, a book and a verse in the Bible, so that's kind of cool. USA, you're always going to have sports teams. Um, some, you can probably tell that this is. Uh, uh, Chicago or Denver or whatever sort of oriented um, location, but um, you know political party member names, which probably came from U.S. Factbook data. You've got um, Metro Center, which probably came from landmark data, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so you know taking Wordsmith one step forward, we wanted to username generation as well, and this is this is real. I actually did this last week, um, but the company wasn't called Trevor Forget; it was something else. I just kind of sanitized that, but. Um, who here knows what curb guessing is? Is anyone familiar with that? Okay. So this is all pre-auth. Um, essentially, let's say you're in an Active Directory network and you uh, want to conduct a password spraying attack. Now, um, something that's really common is you get a list of usernames and you have a, uh, and you have a password and you have a password spraying attack against a domain controller and hope that a user account exists and hope that you get a domain user account. Now, that's really heavy, especially if you don't know if that user account exists and you're doing a lot of wasted authentication attempts. Now, pre-authentication with Kerberos, what you can do with the ticket granting ticket and ticket granting service is you can say, does this user account exist? And then a ticket will come back saying, uh, yes, but we need your password. So you're doing a username enumeration. You're not actually submitting that password, you're just enumerating if that user is there. Uh, conversely, if it doesn't exist, it doesn't prompt you for a password. So this way, you can take your 260K username list in a distributed fashion against all these different domain controllers or Kerberos service, and you can narrow it down um, to maybe, in this case, 505 users and have a more meaningful and effective password spraying attack. It took about seven minutes to run against a, a lot of different domain controllers and um, uh, uncovered or enumerated that 505 user accounts exist in this domain. Now, that's a really low number, but what's really interesting is after I dumped the domain users group, there's only 1,200 users in that domain. And 100 of those are service accounts, and the other, like maybe 50, are locked or disabled. And so now that tells me that I've enumerated uh, half of the user uh, names in this domain just using a geolocation generated um, word list. So I thought that was kind of cool and thought I'd include that. Um, yeah, so Tom's going to talk a little bit about parsers uh, so you guys don't have to write your own. <laughs> so Sand and I put way too much effort in building a lot of these parsers. We have now like these random assortment of shell scripts and Python scripts and Ruby scripts. We thought it'd be a good idea to preserve that. So we have another repo, wordsmith underscore parsers, we'll find that work. If you want to contribute back, if you want to help us improve these, because they're pretty bad, uh, feel free to check it out. Send us pull requests. Uh, in terms of where we see wordsmith going, we're always looking for more data. Um, so parsing things like 
OpenStreetMap. Actually, one of the things that we pulled out recently that we're looking into is uh, geonames, both in the US and abroad. Uh, another idea that we got was from our buddy Patrick about finding the most popular songs that for a given country. So imagine that you um, maybe look out for the Billboard Top 100 or uh, for a, a given country at a given time, and for all those 100 songs, you pull the lyrics out some lyrics database and include those. So people like to use those catchy lyrics sometimes as a, a password. But if you've got ideas, we'd like to hear them. Uh, send us a pull request on uh, GitHub or submit an issue. Uh, hit us up on Twitter. Uh, find us out in the lobby. We'd love to chat. Especially if you have skills, like GIS skills, because Sanj and I, uh, we don't have a knowledge or experience with GIS data sets. Um, we've, this is more of a, a fun hobby project for us, but we really enjoy it. And if you have something you can bring to the table, we'd love to talk to you. Or even if you speak multiple languages, a lot of times we, uh, we'll go out to Wikipedia and look at references, and it'll reference, uh, like if we're looking at like, most popular names for like Portugal, we'll look at the reference for it, and it's some article written in Portuguese by some online journalist. And then Google uh, Chrome Translate only takes us so far. We have to like, dig through the article to figure out where they're referencing. We find that PDF document and then parse it out. Or if you're just into um, hunting down the deepest, darkest corners of the internet and scraping data from them, that'd be helpful too. Uh, in terms of where we see WordSmith going with version 3, my dream is to um, not just have your input be like a country or a state or a county, but to specify like geo coordinates or an address and say, give me all the words in a 50 mile radius of this point. My, yeah, one of my dreams, which actually kind of started happening last night, and I, uh, I, so I, I started building an API. <laughs> I came back from the, uh, well, just a night out, and uh, got back to my hotel room and fell asleep on my table at my desk because I started looking into Ruby API docs. Um, I, yeah, he doesn't want to build an API. I want to build an API. Build so. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that that might be happening again tonight. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that like thank you. Yeah. Appreciate you guys coming out. Thanks. Any questions? I think we got time. Yeah. Why do you guys work Ruby as language for Because Ruby is the best language. <laughs> <laughs> No, honestly, it's just this, it's just a scripting language that we're both very comfortable with. Um, I can, you know, write in other scripting languages, but it was just something that we started with. And yeah, thank. Good question, though. What would you have written Ruby Smith in? Like, if okay. <laughs> were you gonna say Perl? You know, Perl has some use cases. I still regex a lot in Perl. Like, okay. <laughs> How has your knowledge of geography changed over the past year? Oh, and man. And have you found anything interesting? Super interesting. Uh, with OpenStreetMap, this blew my mind. Um, there is not a canonical way to define boundaries across different nations in terms of like granular administrative levels. So if you're looking, like, there's no such thing as states in some countries or counties. Um, so OpenStreetMap has this, in, this notion of boundaries that's like 12 different admin levels. And in uh, the US, like an admin level of five is New York City. An admin level of five in uh, Great Britain is uh, like a particular county. An admin level of five in like Zimbabwe is uh, like an entire, um, an entire uh, province or county, whatever they call it. So it's really hard if I want to have like a county's attribute or a state's attribute or like that, to have it like mean the same thing across the world. So yeah, a lot of little like torts, like things like that. Yeah. Yes. Have you looked at like more illicit things that that people would want to generate passwords on? Like having never viewed porn myself, but Pornhub <laughs> like, a lot of data analysis on like favorite porn trends for per region, right? And then like you you could look at alcohol per region or like weed strains per region. That's super interesting. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't know anything about that. But, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I, one of the things that Sam and I talk about this all the time of how, like, what we kind of day we want to include, because the focus of it is um, it's targeted, right? Like we're not just pulling out <coughs> random data sets. We want to have a, a tie that data back to something that we know, which is a, in this case the target's location. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you want to get more specific, like we started looking into like social media parsing. Like if we have a particular user targeted, let's go grab their Twitter feed, Facebook, LinkedIn, and include those. So if you got trends like that that you can tie back to something that's targeted, sure, why not? Just gotta make sure they're a big pervert for you. Shall we? <laughs> All people on your net. Uh, since you've been writing this and using this, do you have some rough estimate of, of how much extra passwords this typically gets you? Yeah, so that's something that we actually did last year. Um, we had a progressional sort of um, graph in the version one slide and talking to some other people in the industry who've used this tool as well, we've got some rough metrics, but typically in that first cracking session with the popular word list, you'll get 40%. And um, on like the bare minimum I've recovered with Wordsmith in another few minutes was 12%, and I've gone as high as another 50%. So it's pretty nuts. Um, Mubix was saying that he did a cracking session last year, and um, he, did, he went from 40 to 92. So it's pretty crazy. We keep hearing stories about um, people that they're, they're cracking hashes for a particular location where everybody there is like a fan of the local like high school team yeah. or the local college team. And they bring in the Wordsmith data and it just skyrockets. Yes. Have you looked at uh, using social media data like hashtags tied with geolocation data? Oh, dude, that's awesome. That's a good yeah. idea. That's, that's a really good idea. Us. Write some code for us. Yeah. <laughs> like geotag tweets, things like that. <laughs> What's the license on Wordsmith? Uh, MIT. So do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Anything else? Did oh. you put like communities of practice at the top level of a country? or Because they might go across countries, right? Like Toastmasters programming. Like, oh, gotcha. Like that, sure. Which would actually be across boundaries. Mm. How would you include that? Would it just be a minus y and include it as a second one? Or? I guess so, yeah. Well, we've done that for um, like re religions and language. Yeah. Uh, so we have a separate directory outside right. of the scope of the countries. Okay. So we have that configuration file. So it's where you put in, say, in this could like the USA configuration file, put in a, an attribute for that, and then when we uh, go out and get the data, we'll just go out and grab it and yeah. pull it in. It's a common directory, I guess. Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, it looked like in your example, when Gave it the dash M to mangle it there. Yeah. And then you fed it I think that's an I think that's an error. Yeah. Um, I, so that's more effective that way. Uh, yes and no. Probably probably no because okay. um, it just creates a bloated word list at that point, and it just probably doesn't have a lot of. Uh, I, I should have actually truncated that down to seven as well, and okay. in terms of minimum character length, but um, you could. What would you do, so Tom? One of the yeah. Options that we threw in um, that I didn't speak about is that you can lowercase all your output, which is why I recommend if you're going to throw it into something like John or Hashcat, yeah. because their mangling rules are far superior. Yeah. We included ours because you might not always be hash cracking. You might be using this list for online password guessing or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? One more. What about including lists for like industries and hobbies? Can you give like, some examples? Well, if you're targeting a, a bank, mm. then there's probably a Oh, for sure. That'd be a good idea. Black's Law Dictionary. Yeah, that, actually that fits in really well with where we've gone with religions and languages, and I think that would fit perfectly. Yeah. So, and this actually brings up an interesting point. We talk to a lot of folks after this, and we, we present something like this, and we get these great ideas, but it's really hard to marry uh, the idea with the legitimate data source. So you gotta go out and find those data sources, make sure the license is okay for you to use it, then you gotta parse it and then include it. So that's why we're kind of, as a, a, a plea, if you have specific knowledge about things like that, send us a pull request, upload a file, we'd be happy to accept it and share it with everybody. Cool. Thanks every time. Yeah. Thank you guys.